Hello and welcome to the first Link for Growth TV finance show. The, I'm Jenny Braithwaite and this is the first of a, of a monthly show on finance and money related topics. It's actually going to be the first of a series of shows for L4G TV as well so we'll be, I'll mention that a little bit more again towards the end of the show. We're here today talking about EU VAT and what that means for you, particularly as a very small business owner. It's not the only people that it affects, but that's who we're kind of concentrating on today. So before we get started, I just want to do a little bit of, of um, housekeeping. We're going to be on air for about an hour. I've got two guests with me today who will be here to ask answer your questions. If you have any questions, um, please head over to the Google Plus event page and answer them there. We will do. We will try our very best to answer all of your questions. But please be aware, we do have limited time, so we might not get to everybody's questions. But we will answer them on the page and so on later if we don't. Oh, and that's me forgetting to turn off the link on the YouTube page to check check this is actually working. So that brings me nicely into the it is a hangout and it is a brand new show so there are potential for tech issues happening and things like that. If anything does go wrong please just bear with us and hopefully we'll get it all sorted back out again. So today I've got two expert guests here who represent different kinds of aspects to do with the new EU VAT rules. I have with me Les Howard who, excuse me looking down, I'm just reading my notes so I can read out what about Les properly for you. Les is, a, is, our, is our VAT industry expert that we have on for today. He's been involved in VAT for over 30 years and since joining HM Customs and Exercise um, as it was known then back in 1983. He's a gamekeeper turned poacher when he joined a management consultancy company and he then left to form his own company in 1994. He works with SMEs and charities and provides technical support to a number of accountants. You will also find him delivering VAT training and sitting on the tax tribunal. So clearly Les is a guy who knows his stuff when it comes to VAT. So he's here to talk about the technical aspects of VAT, the practical what we need to do and so on. If you'd just like to come and say hello to everybody Les. Hi I'm Les, can you hear me? It's good. We can Les. Excellent, it's good to be here. So we're up and ready to go and ready to try and give people some answers to their questions. Excellent. We'll be coming we'll be firing plenty of questions at you in, in just a moment, Les. And my other guest today is Rosie oh I'm going to pronounce this name wrong. Rosie Slosek? Is, Rosie, is that right? <laughs> Slosek. Slosek. I do apologize. Rosie is a tax return coach who specialises in cake loving freelancers in the UK. Sounds good to me. Rosie loves having loves cake, having tea in luxury hotels and her allotment. She lives in London, works from home and runs her business from her tiny teeny flat. Sorry, I just added the teeny bit, the tiny bit in there. Rosie is also a founding member of the EU VAT Action Group and has attended meetings with the government and HMRC. The, the EU VAT Action Group, actually I'll let Rosie come and say hello and let you tell, tell you what the EU VAT Action Group is all about. Rosie? Oh yes, um, we've got a basic it's a group of um, well, most of us are ladies, but we also have a VAT expert who's a man. Hi, Les. So, Les isn't the expert, but our VAT expert also is a man. And um, basically, we just ended up, we, none of us knew each other, and we got together in November, and we found out the actual implications of all of this, because it's not, it's not just about that, actually. The, how you actually put this into place actually encompasses a very, very wide range of issues, and 
we see all the impact this would make from everything from tiny knitting pattern sellers, you know, actually right up to, um, you know, medium-sized misses, you know, as one's up to, you know, 10 million turnover, um, they're actually suffering actually just as much, just they tend to have more financial resources to deal with it. But it's a problem for them too, and we got together, and um, actually in a very short space of time, we've generated our campaign actually uh, across the EU, the UK, and the world, to actually, within two weeks, we got... Um, the government round a table with some of the big bods in HMRC and including that you had a VAT in HMRC, I'm not sure that's a technical title, he's called Andrew Webb, lovely man, um, to actually get them to understand. We got some wonderful concessions actually about this so we have light touch for HMRC um, but it's, of course all of this it, we've, uh, does actually need sorting out because it's still a massive problem. Um, the problems are actually not actually about VAT, it's about the other issues. But of course, it, because it is VAT, we, we need the VAT as well. So I'm very pleased you're here, Les. Absolutely, definitely. Um, so I suppose before we dive into the questions and so on, we should just actually explain what is all this EU VAT we're talking about? What, what is the, what, why are we suddenly worrying about EU VAT? Um, I'll just do a very quick sort of summary of it. Um, the basic thing is that within the EU, the, the where VAT is charged on a digital service has changed from where the seller is to where the customer is. And that came in on the 1st of January 2015. Now that's the m absolute complete basic issues and we're going to get much more into what the implications are and so on as we go through. But I thought it was important that everyone knew, just in case there, were, there was somebody who hadn't actually come across this before, why we're bothering to have a whole show talking about this. So maybe um, Rosie, could you explain in practical terms um, and for uh, in in reality, what these new rules mean for the very for the micro business way below any VAT limits, that kind of thing, and what's actually changing for these businesses? And then I'm going to come over to Les, and he can sort of talk a little bit about. Um, I'll come on and talk a little bit about the practicalities of what you can do about it as well. So Rosie, if you can just sort of explain about how is it actually affecting these businesses? Well, it, the, the change actually sounds extremely simple. What used to happen is that you go into your local shop, and your local shop is in the UK, and whether you're from Singapore, Vietnam, the United States, or down the road, you go into that shop in the UK, and you pay that on what you buy. So far, so simple. So, same rules for your local shop as it would be for, say, um, your local shop is someone who happens to be a running online business in, again, Vietnam, Australia, United States, or wherever it, whatever, wherever it is. Um, you would obviously obey the rules of the country and you would pay that according to the rules of your country. Uh, because the UK, I don't know if you can, Les can tell me, but quite possibly the UK actually has the highest um, VAT threshold in the world. We have an awful lot of businesses that probably other countries don't so much because there's a higher threshold to even have a business. So the place of supply has changed. So, the, so instead now what you'd have to do is if you have an, an online business, um, if, for example, that person goes into the equivalent of your little um, online local shop selling knitting patterns in Australia and they buy it, you then have to apply um, the tax there. Now, in Australia, it's absolutely fine because at the moment, Australia aren't, uh, don't have any rules about this, so you're fine. But if, for example, somebody in Germany, even if it's a UK resident who they happen to be in Germany at the time comes along and buys it, you then have to charge the German interpretation of the law and German VAT rate. This sounds very simple, but actually the mechanics of actually how it happens and how you do it are actually stupendously complicated. But in theory, it's actually very simple. You just the just the rules of supply are, are changing. It's it's how we actually can do that and how we can comply with the law. That's the problem. 
So Rosie, is, does that actually affect all services? Um, you were sort of giving the example of the shop there, but it, it just affects at the moment digital services, that's correct, and I wonder if you could just say a little bit about that and then, yeah, if you could just... It's affecting um, broadcasting, telecommunications and digital services. Now broadcasting and telecommunications, now we're talking television, we're talking um, telephones, that kind of thing. They, just by definition of how difficult it is to deliver those services, they're almost all extremely big businesses and they tend to be a lot more less dynamic and a lot more static. Um, digital services, which includes everything from said knitting pattern to a download from your local Cumbrian, uh, Cumbrian musician that you heard in your local pub, right through to you the WordPress site for your, um, the WordPress theme for your WordPress site. Um, all just about all kinds of downloads, all digital services. There's no minimum threshold for the digital service um, at all agreed across the EU. So technically speaking, all digital services are included, and there isn't an EU-wide agreed minimum. Therefore, you actually need to apply the country's interpretation, not actually HMRC's. Although HMRC's interpretation does actually apply to UK cells if you do actually are VAT registered in normally as well. And that was my unmuting not working. <laughs> so I'd just like to to um, ask again, so I'm just looking down at my notes here because there's so much here that I needed to make notes to make sure we actually covered everything today. You mentioned that this is a, this is a real big change for small businesses. Is it particularly the fact that it's an administrative burden or are people kind of scared as well that this is actually going to spread around the world and things like that, that it's going to be happening in other areas and is this actually going to be spreading to other things beyond digital services as well? Both, in fact all three of them it's already happened. Um, Japan, Canada, I believe, although I haven't checked, um, and other, I think it's a few other countries as well, are already actually looking at, uh, at doing this. Um, I believe that South Africa actually already had is in this in place, but they do have a distance selling regulations things. So if you are at the smaller end, it doesn't affect you. Um, it's going to, this is going to be applied to physical products next year as well. Um, and who knows where they're going to go from there because um, after they've implemented the physical products, I mean, I, I don't know, I, I don't know what the EU are going to do, but it wouldn't surprise me if they actually start extending this out to do you do business with anybody outside of your home country, it will apply. So to go back to your second question was the administration. Um, again, this is, this is one of the differences actually between the bigger businesses, the big businesses like Amazon, Apple and Google, they have already either put up prices or restricted choice and restricted services to the EU and the UK. Um, and obviously they're not exactly short of a few pennies, those particular businesses, and they've already restricted choice and put up prices. For the, the lower end, so for example the medium sized businesses on 10 million um, and below and the small business sized businesses on 2 million pounds and below, they're getting hit with both the amount of admin because um, you know services like Leslie they're going to be a lot busier because they will have to do a lot more work, there's a lot more admin, but it's just the complexity of this. So, for example, we know of one business who's a £2 million turnover and they're having to spend £100,000 on just upgrading their services to deal with the extra processing load, which I appreciate is slightly technical. But £100,000 is an awful lot just for one element of the compliance. So, my main thing is that, yes, it's really hitting the you know, link for growth and you know, my, my clients in our areas as well. But, you know, this isn't going after the tiny guys thing. This is pretty much a problem nearly all the way to the top of the biggest businesses as well.
Wow, that kind of really does put it into context that if a two million pound turnover business is spending a hundred thousand, if you scale that down, it's quite a scary thing for a really small business. That sort of amount of money. Obviously, a really small business wouldn't be wouldn't be spending that sort of amount of money. Um, it's actually brought up quite a few um, extra questions for me, which I will be coming back to some of the things that you said there, Rosie. Um, but before we do that, um, I'd actually, before we get into talking about what you can actually do on a practical basis to try and deal with um, the VU, EU VAT, which is very much where I'm going to be bringing Les in as well as Rosie, I'd just like to ask, and I think I'd, I'd like to ask both of you this, um, digital services, how, have we been given an actual proper definition of these? Is it does it apply across the board? And then I want to I want to have a little bit of a talk about something related to that. But if you can just if you can just sort of do if Rosie we can start with you just talking a little bit about what is defined as a digital service, and talking about more of the things that the very small business will be doing rather than the large telecom companies and so on. And then um, I'm going to come to Les and sort of get a bit of a feel on how this is working within the VAT industry itself. Yeah, one of the problems is that it isn't defined. Now, uh, this is one of the things that the uh, EU Action Campaign .org, um, is actually for. Is really, this needs to be defined on an EU level because it is not actually possible to any business to comply with 28 different legal interpretations of the same law simultaneously. Um, and so, HMRC have now, uh, well, after pressure, come out with, with, out with a document which does define for them. So, for UK sales, if for businesses is already VAT registered, um, what counts? So. Um, with, I'm assuming that over time they're going to clear up their own contradictions in that. Um, so for that, it's absolutely fine uh, for UK sales. But unfortunately, you need to apply for sales in the other EU countries. You do need to apply the other countries' rules. And um, frankly, I mean, V8 is, is complex enough. This is why we have experts like Les. You know, this isn't. This is this is far too complex for those businesses to be appropriate to be dealing with. Um, so, I mean, effective, what we're all doing is we're all making a decision we're all comfortable with for at least the next five and a half months. HMRC have said they're going to apply light touch for it to give us a bit of time, but this is not really possible. The admin level is just sky high. It's you can't simultaneously do all of this and comply with it. So, um, it's just a case of it's one of those deci business decisions when really you need to make your own decision, what you're happy with, not throw toys out of prams. It may be some people may suspend the businesses for a while. Some people may go down the different um, partial compliance options, which is you know where the different plugins and experts like Les come in. But you also may want to actually encourage your accountant to actually consult an expert because accountants don't tend to be experts in that either. <laughs> um, it would be absolutely brilliant actually if there was some specialist service um, actually on this for accountants. It was a, again appropriately priced for accountants to actually access this as well. Um, but you know we're we're all we're not in business to have an easy life. Are we? we're in it because we we love the learning curve, and uh, uh, so it's this is just one of these one of these things. Um, we have the beauty of being able to trade um, on online to anyone in the world, and sometimes something throws a little spanner in the works, and this is one of those times when we all need to step up to the plate. I think that's um, very much, very much the case. There's a bit of a, a spanner in the works. If we see it that way, it kind of feels a little bit more as if it's not going to be a permanent terror. It's just going to be something we can work through. Les, I'd like you to come on and talk to us both about what digital services are and where we actually stand as far as the actual VAT rules and so on are. are Currently, and anything, and if you can mention anything else surrounding that kind of thing that you think is relevant at this point. Can I just comment on uh, Rose's point about the administration and about getting advice? Uh, and she's absolutely right that 
with a lot of SMEs and micro businesses, the costs of getting good advice easily become prohibitive. Um, people like me are not cheap. Um, and so for a business that turns over, say, 10,000 or 20,000 a year, it's potentially all their profit in a year goes. So that they're left in a really difficult position. And that is a particular characteristic of UK commerce. We have loads and loads of people that operate businesses from their bedrooms. And as, again, Rosie said, we have a high fat registration threshold, which means that those people are not fat registered. They've never had to charge fat. They've never had to think about it. So it isn't just an administrative burden, but it's a potential price barrier that they have to go through. So those are two big barriers for many small businesses. So we're having to deal with that. And I think the the political argument is very much Rosie's bag. And you know, it's not something I particularly get into, although obviously I'm, I'm aware of it and, and follow what's going on online. In terms of some legal definitions, I got in front of me the EU definitions of telecoms, broadcasting, and e-services, which are the combined definition of digital services. So there is a legal definition, and if people are listening and we can put the link up later, it's called the Implementing Regulations, and it's actually from 2011. So it's actually not new legislation. It's been there for four years, three, year, three to four years. And it's Article 6 and 7 provide all that information. As I say, we can put the links up. But, of course, it's in legal, legal speak. It's not really easy to, to read. And it lists what is and isn't the, uh, you know, the different services. The simple rule of thumb that HMRC have applied, which is probably a good starting place, is in terms of an e-service, if there is no minimal or sorry, if there is no or minimal human intervention in the delivery of the service, it will be covered by MOS. So that is the starting point. So if someone can go on your website, download your knitting pattern or your steam engine noise. Les, just a moment. Could you um, please explain for people who aren't um, VAT experts or perhaps haven't been following um, about the EU VAT what MOS is? Yes, of course. Uh, MOS is the big problem thing we hear about. It's called the mini one-stop shop. It's uh, a special, it's actually a simplification scheme, uh, which would surprise people. Because if we didn't have MOS, the administrative burden would require that all of our micro businesses would have to register for VAT in every EU member state where they make any sales. So it would actually be, and I'm sure Rosie would agree with that, is it would actually be 28 times worse. Um, because they'd have to go through the hoops in each member state. MOS simply allows you to register once to cover all your EU activities. It's called a mini one-stop shop because it will be extended. And as Rosie correctly said, it will be extended to B2C sales of goods in due course. And ultimately, the aim is to have a single VAT return to cover everything you do in Europe. So large organizations with multiple branches, instead of doing one VAT return per member state, will be able to do a single VAT return that covers all their activities. So it's part of that process. But as we know, EU wheels are very slow turning. We joined the single market 22 years ago, and we've only just seen the rules on B2C digital services change. So all these things take a long time. To, to work through the system. So, oh, just I'm just trying to pick up where we, we got to. In terms of um, the requirements of, of MOS, the, the rules require that a UK trader, irrespective of turnover, um, has to declare VAT on a B2C, so business to um, consumer sale, to any customer anywhere in the EU. That sounds very simple, um, but as again, as Rosie said, it's much more complex because definitions will vary from member state to member state. 
you've got questions about what if someone's traveling, what if they're in a boat or on a plane, and all those sorts of, of issues. And there is guidance on that. It's just you know a bit sleep-inducing, really, to read it. Uh, that's the, the problem there. And it's also allied with a rule that says if you make supplies into another member state, no VAT registration threshold applies. And that has been in, in law for just over two years. So if I go and clean somebody's windows uh, in France, I have to register for VAT there because there's no registration threshold because I'm, I'm a UK national. So the, com the interaction of different rules um, has, has created this particular problem, which we describe as MOS. So MOS is the EU rule. It's not the problem, as it were. It's the EU rule. EU rule. So basically, it's just it, we're kind of coming to the point where you can see why I, um, the hashtag VAT mess has um, sprung up all over Twitter and social media surrounding this because it really is quite a complex area. Um, I've just got a question um, that's come up in the um, event page. Tony Cohen is asking, does, does the MOSS report help with the administrative headache adequately and is it cheap? What? Les, do you want to take what is the MOST report? I presume he means um, being able to do one VAT return for under MOST rather than in each individual country. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's an administrative simplification. What you're required to provide to do the return is the gross value of your sales for each member state that you sell to. So I would hope that people's sales systems would be able to identify that. So you pick up when a customer makes a purchase, you pick up the member state that they are from, um, and then that simply goes into you know, some sort of database or spreadsheet and gives you a total for that calendar quarter. And the MOS, the MOS portal works out the VAT for you per member state, assuming it's got it right which of course is not guaranteed. So what you're saying there is basically that if you're registered under MOS then that will, you can count all of your EU sales under that. That's correct. You're, you're required. Excellent. Okay, right. So say how can you actually explain to us how what does a business need to do say they decide to go down the route of registering for MOS I want to come back to talking about how businesses can deal with um, not having to deal with going through registering for MOS and that kind of thing and I'm going to bring Rosie back in to talk about that because that's very much what what a lot of the businesses and so on that Rosie deals with there. But I'd just like if you could um, talk to us about how do people register for MOSS and do we have to be UK VAT registered to do that? And also, does that then mean I have to charge VAT on my UK sales as well? Okay, this is one of those really sneaky pieces of legislation. And if I were to show you it in the UK legislation, you'd be very cross. And I'm sure Rosie is familiar with it. It simply assumes that to be MOST registered, you are already VAT registered in the UK. So it doesn't even insist it, it assumes it, which is a little bit underhand. But therefore, both in a legal framework and in practice, you have to register for UK VAT first to allow you to register for MOSS. So that's the, the basic process. Obviously, all that is done on, online nowadays. Now, one of the concessions, and I guess we thank Rosie for the concession, is that if you were not required to be registered in the UK, you can still treat yourself as if you were not registered. So you don't charge UK VAT on your UK sales you simply charge VAT on your EU sales. But you can also recover VAT input tax on your costs on your UK VAT return. 
So you submit two returns. You submit a MOS return where you pay, and you submit a UK return where you claim. Now, as a, as a specialist, that sort of arrangement invites problems, and it will create all sorts of issues. My phone will be red hot in April, I have no doubt, because that will create all sorts of difficulties. It sounds it sounds sort of so simple when you start talking about it, but the longer you talk about it, the more complex issues just seem to arise all the time out of things. Um, could you just um, confirm what the UK VAT registration limit is for us, please, Les? It's eighty-one thousand pounds at the moment, and that goes up every year at budget time. Okay, fantastic. Right. Um, what you were saying there, where the legislation, it basically assumes um, people were already registered for VAT to be able to go into the MOS. I think that kind of, it really does show, as, as sort of um, the EU VAT Action Group, uh, just kind of where they've come from, the complete lack of understanding of how many really small businesses they were in the UK. Would you say that that's um, a fair analysis of that point, Rosie? Yes, this is one of the actual elements that we're, we're saying is because HMRC, for example, estimated there were 36,000 businesses in the UK that would be um, affected by this. Uh, and I think that might be 36,000 uh, possibly under the um, VAT threshold. Um, well, it's a conservative estimate, and that's with a small C. Um, we're on quarter of a million, and to be honest, given the fact that basically my job is not to do accounts for people, it's to sort of help them do their own, I'm at the end where God, at least a third of my, of my new clients didn't even know they need to be registered as self-employed at all anyway. And we do have probably one of the most understandable, um, well, I think probably HMRC are the most approachable tax authority in the world. I'll go out on a limb and I'll say that. Um, you know, they do try the best they can to, to help and to be really reasonable. Um, and then they really, really do. I've, I've, I've even met with the people now. Um, but you see, of course, they, you, know, you do have to have a VAT number, which immediately means, even if you don't claim any UK VAT back, that immediately means 4 nil VAT returns for the UK. They're not that complicated in the UK, but it's still admin and it's still a learning curve. Then, of course, the Batmos returns, which, from what I understand, aren't actually stupendously complicated once you have the data. They're actually on a different admin cycle quite often to the other ones. And, of course, the lower-end businesses, quite often, once you do have to be VAT registered, there is a flat rate scheme that we have. So, again, because you know, VAT is very awkward tax, as we all know. Um, you know, there is a deliberately, uh, we have a flat rate scheme. Now, um, actually, actually, I'd like to ask Les a question, which was, given the fact that there are currently, a, I think there's at least 75 different rates of VAT across the EU, which, of course, we would all have to know what they all apply to, because, um, while, of course, while the person is actually uh, doing their transaction, um, I'd actually like to ask Les actually how the, VA, the flat rate um, VAT rates apply into that because no one's been able to even get their head around the question. So, fine, might be slightly cheeky and ask. Um, that's, no, that's fine. The answer is actually very simple, Rosie. You cannot use the flat rate scheme with MOS. End of. Oh, well, that's simple at least. Oh, I like that. That's one thing sorted. It's one of the things that I picked up very quickly. And I can quote all the relevant, relevant bits for people that want to. You just can't use both. So, again, the small business here likes flat rate scheme. Thousands of you use it because it's so beneficial. But they can't use it from us because they're not suppliers in the UK. So, easy answer, but not the answer that small businesses uh, would welcome, I'm afraid. Else, it's simple, Les, and I think simple at this point. Anything simple is actually quite good. <laughs> I think simple is definitely um, something that really appeals right now. It's like when I w when I sort of said the very introductory sentence about what had changed. 
it sounded so simple. It sounds like it'd just be a what are we all worrying about, but the more you look into it and the more you actually try and work out what to do, it actually just gets worse. I think something else I'd like to ask you particularly, Rosie, and I think a lot of people are going to be asking themselves this, why didn't I hear about this before? Why did I only hear about this like about four or five weeks before it was coming in? How am I supposed to comply with it in that time, even if I was able to easily? Um, basically, they, they did know that we exist because we've heard that officially they did knew that we exist. It's just that an assumption was made that all businesses like, like ours use third-party platforms. The fact that the third-party platforms can't comply, in, won't comply, although obviously I put a legal disclaimer under that, um, or actually aren't able to because, again, the developers and the third-party platforms um, do actually need a set definition of all of these things which don't exist because there isn't any UI definition to actually be able to develop all of this, and they don't have it. Um, and this is this is why the problems uh, sort of happen because even amongst the uh, you know like accountants um, have it it's put have been it's sort of been there but it's been buried under sort of material that would be extremely useful if you suffered from severe insomnia it's you know EU rate change for work for, you know for Europe and a lot of us and has been affected we're basically on the right on the edge of, of a global change on this we're the people driving the changes and we're the people with the very innovative businesses so a lot of this it just oh just a place to supply that's easy well we don't deal with VAT or we don't deal with VAT outside the UK which one particular um, tax expert to tax experts has told me therefore it's buried in some advice somewhere and what do you do is again accountants have been asked by this what do I do and again they have no idea and it's this is more this is this is really really complex for you from tax VAT experts because the real problem here isn't actually in VAT it's the technical and the um, it's the TechLX technical website aspects of actually how do you implement it rather than for example the simple part and I do that in quotes less is actually which rate do, do I apply to which country and how do I apply three rates of different VAT to one in one in one shopping basket to one person who may be from the UK but they happen to be on holiday in Spain at the time and is that UK or Germany or you know whatever this is actually stupendously technical and actually the VAT part is I've never thought I'd say this is actually the simple bit I've got a feeling that a lot of people never thought they would say that, Rosie. <laughs> I just wanted to pick up what you said about talking about third-party platforms. Could you maybe explain to us what a third-party platform actually is? And also, if people are only using these, should that have meant they weren't affected at all? A third party platform is something like, it's not something like eBay, which is a marketplace. So, for example, and again, they, they brought in this to try and get money from Amazon and that kind of thing. So, what I'm about to say is deeply ironic. If, for example, you sell through Amazon, I believe that Amazon actually take the kind of like the legal responsibility for charging the correct VAT rate. So, you could actually put absolutely everything, assuming that what you do is appropriate to Amazon through Amazon. They will charge all the appropriate rates for you. Plus, of course, they will charge the, the irrelevant the UK VAT rate, even if you're not registered for VAT in the UK. Um, and we'll leave out the details about how much they charge that service and all the rest of it. Um, but also, for example, platforms like Ravelry, Etsy. Um, a lot of these, for example, Ravelry has 4 million users across the world, and it has a staff of five people. I think Etsy has a staff of four in the UK. It might be less than this. Um, th 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 there's not very many of them. And again, we also have the payment providers. What we're talking about here is a paid transaction. And a lot of these da the data that you're required to collect is actually, some of it is not actually collected by the payment providers unless you have one of the higher cost and mostly not appropriate to small business solutions. And even then, actually, quite a lot of the time, the data isn't actually there and is available. Um, it's a slight problem when you know, people in HMRC don't know the difference between an email address and an IP address. 
well, that's it's, it's getting a little into all the sort of technical side. But one of the ways of um, making it easier is actually moving everything to at least a partially compliant um, third party platform. Like there's U Udemy is one, ClickBank is another. There are separate issues with that, but at least some of them are mostly compliant, some of them are 100% compliant, some of them are compliant enough for the moment. But um, us in EU for action, we actually did a survey to actually look at the assumptions and 60% of UK businesses, so the more with it ones who were actually around enough, knew, knew, knew about it in December um, to actually answer the survey, 60% of the UK businesses use the third party platform, 5%, that's 5% of the EU businesses not included in the UK, which astonished us all. Can I just come over to Les, and while we're talking about the third party um, platforms, from a VAT expert, expert's point of view, do you think that this is going to solve the problem only serve, selling through third party platforms, or can you foresee there actually being issues from that as well, especially ones that are perhaps based all or anywhere in the world that aren't within the EU, is that likely to make any difference? It, it does. A, a compliant platform is a great help to a micro business in the UK to the extent it allows them not to register for MOS. And that's that's the main thing and I advised a client last week to do exactly that he was going to stop trading I said well you need to talk to so-and-so um, I knew they were compliant because they would paid me to make sure they were compliant um, so you know uh, as Rosie said there are a number of um, different marketplaces different third parties there who do do the work for you and some of them quite rightly make a lot of the fact um, that they're protecting their sellers and so that they 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 obviously must registered and they look after their clients there are whole technical issues there uh, EU and UK legislation relating to agency sales are a massively complex area and there's very little in the guidance about that so that's a another legal time bomb really that's waiting for all the people who we're recommending use these you know, compliant third parties, what will happen if customs decide to, you know, challenge them on the basis of the, the agency rules? Um, so there is a technical complex, technical complexity there. But that's a, a useful thing. Um, it means you're only dealing with one customer instead of 100,000 customers or whatever it is. So there are practical administrative issues as well that I think would be helpful. But then I don't sell in that way. So, you know, it's only what people tell me. It's not my own own personal experience. But I would certainly advise a micro business. You know, one of the options is find a good third party where the effective commission rate isn't too high, isn't thirty percent. It's less than ten percent ideally, and you know, see if they do the job for you. And of course, if they're good, they will attract business, and that will be good for everybody. But unfortunately, you know. Some of them that, that I've been hearing have been very slow to, you know, respond, and I understand why from what Rosie said because they they themselves are tiny organisations, but they just have a massive throughput. So again, it's part of the hashtag VAT mess that you referred to. Rosie um, has the EU VAT Action Group. I believe they. Awesome. I've seen somewhere that someone's actually collating um, third-party um, platforms that are um, compliant. Yes, that's right. It's um, Rachel uh, Andrews is on uh, GitHub, which sounds extremely dodgy if you're not in the developer community. Um, it's it's one of the um, it's one of the big it's kind of like online communities. It's all a bit I hate to say this, it's a bit like a developer Facebook, although they won't like me saying that. <laughs> Everybody's there, and she's actually collated um, that on there. There is a link to that on my um, um, EU VAT changes um, blog post, and I'm I'm assuming there's probably one on our website as well. Um, it's euvataction.org, and um, I'll put the, I'll give you the link for my um, blog post, uh, Jenny. You can put that up there. Um, there are some of the solutions out there are partially compliant. Some of them are 
mostly compliant enough for the uh, concession that we, we have from HMRC. Um, one thing HMRC are very, very, very definite on, we, we say thank you very much to Andrew Webb for this, is the fact that um, they really, really don't want businesses to stop trading. There's always going to be some people who say, I just really don't want it anymore, but um, there's always going to be something, isn't it? I mean, this is the difference, you know, there's business, there's always going to be something. Um, but again, it's one of those things you do need to make your own decision on this. Um, and, and there's somebody else who's compiling a list as well. But if you go onto the, um, onto the website, they're all on there. We keep everybody up to date with, with, with what's happening. Um, and again, it's things like, I'm not sure this is on the website, but Andrew Webb, who's the um, HMRC um, VAT guy at the top of that, he actually said that at the moment, for example, every time you process a refund, you do actually need to amend your VAT, your VAT MOS return, which obviously is an awful lot of admin. But he did actually say at one of the meetings we had that things like that will apparently get sorted out over time. It's just obviously just even for just technically for them, having a system where they have to process all these different rates, give all the different amounts to all the different countries. That's I just I don't want to think about the complexity of that computer system. <laughs> So that in itself, it's a bit of a nightmare at the moment with the refunds, but that will apparently get sorted later on. So if you go on the um, our website, uvaction.org, um, and on my blog post, there's um, a link to Rachel's um, lists on that. I think, I think um, um, that might be really easy. Oh, what? hang on a second. There's something strange happening there. Right. I think what might be quite very useful is if we actually... Um, collated a list of all the different links and so on um, and put them together and actually put them into the um, event box for people. So if we can sort of, we can work together after the show and we'll put that together and then, can, then everything can just be in one place as well as us giving the links and that sort of thing now as well. I just wanted to move on and talk a little bit about um, some of the actual, maybe not quite just purely VAT implications of it. We've kind of we've we've touched on some of this. But I want to talk about Rosie, you've talked you said something about um, businesses are actually going out of business because of this. And I know I read a, a blog post um, on the EU VAT Action website about what in the first week. And I think I saw that you th it was around 200 businesses had actually gone out of business because of this. Do you think that's going to carry on growing or do you think we've kind of seen the majority of what's going to happen there? I think it's actually probably more than 200. There's an awful lot of people who haven't stopped their business. It's going out of business is slightly different to they decide to close down their business. And I don't, I, I'm not sure the, the, the differences in the numbers between both of them. There were an awful lot of launches which haven't happened. There were an awful lot of, of people got, taking their business to the next level, which had happened. There's quite a few people who thought they didn't have to deal with it because they weren't VAT registered. Um, they had a nasty shock. And that, that's across the EU, it's not just for the UK. Um, I think probably there's going to be a shakedown in the number of people who are just who might want to cause of doing it, not so much for a laugh, but just doing it as a bit of fun. Um, but fundamentally, you know, it's just a hobby business, which is just as valid as, as everything else. It is still a business, and, you know, some people, they just, there's a certain amount of admin, they don't want to do any madmen, this is just too much. Um, if that's you, I would say, um, just take a decision. See, every, every single business needs to do this. Is just take a decision about what's appropriate for the moment. And it may be that you go, okay, I want to say close my business down for a year, and then I'll see, come back and see what happens. What I've decided to do is to basically remove all digital products for a year, um, and then I'm going to see what happens. And I've done that for a lot of reasons, not just to do with the admin as well. Um, that's what, and I've obviously got the campaign taking time as well. Um, it's just to take a decision, look at everything. But I know some other businesses have taken this opportunity to actually take their businesses up another level. They've said, okay, right, well, instead of having digital for just, say, a year, six months, uh, they're only going to do all live um, services. That's what they're going to do. They're going to experiment in lots of different things to find out 
what's going to re what really really works for their for their target market and their audiences. Which you know normally we may not do this. It feels like a bit of a risk, but they're taking this opportunity and they're doing that and they're just changing their marketing. They're you know going for different things. And I find that really really exciting. Excellent, thank you, Rosie. And that brings me nicely into a question from Carol Dodsley. What about the issues? For, cons for cons customers and potential loss of business because of the information the seller actually has to collect at the time of sale. I don't know which one of you wants to take that. Who wants? You probably both got things to say on that. Who would like to go first? Go on, I'll give Rosie a little um, a little break. Um, my understanding is that you don't need you don't need um, data protection registration because the information you hold is small. Uh, there was a concern about it November, December time. But my understanding is that um, you don't need to register. Um, the problem is that you do need 10 years of records, which is different to the six years that we're used to in the UK. So for every sale, you have to hold that data for 10 years. Now, obviously, you hold that in an electronic form, um, but it does need to be auditable by HMRC for 10 years, which is Again, for a small business, that's a little bit of hassle. But we do have cloud, so you know, in principle, there should be ways of you know, of doing that. I would just say one of the again, one of the other very very simple things that got answered very quickly to my absolute delight was the concern about registering a data controller, like Les said. And this information comes under the information you hold as part of doing your account. So that one got very, very neatly sorted out very quickly, which is a great concern. Um, but I think the main problem is just that not only do you have to keep it for 10 years, which actually breaks other elements of EU law, which they don't appear to have noticed, um, but of course you need to have backups. Um, you need to have backups of that, which of course, you I mean, you have to have all of these things for your own accounts. But you see, of course, it's... it's it's you on the line. It's slightly different when you're actually effectively holding it on behalf of other countries' um, audit teams, which is actually what you're doing. Uh, and the other concern is, one, it's not possible at the moment to collect this data because what we're talking about is things like IP addresses, which quite a lot of the time aren't actually accurate, um, people's physical addresses, which isn't that worried about, but things like the country code of your credit card. There's quite a lot of fairly... It's not the kind of data you you really want to be having. There's a reason we use payment providers because quite rightly, uh, you know, the payment regulations are really very severe and most of us don't want to deal with this. It's why we use PayPal. We love PayPal. Um, you know, and, and, and there are other payment providers available. Um, but there's a reason we, we, we don't have this. It's not really appropriate considering how difficult it is to actually keep data like that secure for these tiny businesses across the EU to be actually requiring to be holding this data for 10 years. Because we need to keep three pieces of data, and a minimum of one of maximum one of those need to be self-declared. And I'm told that, that Les, that this is for uh, audit reasons. Um, um, so there has to be, because of course, you see, if two of the pieces contradict. You need a third piece. And you know, do you? We're all very concerned with um, with cyber security, and it, it goes against all of that. Are you going to trust a site that asks where you physically are? Um, what do you do? And one of the other concerns is that as a business, we're not protected against people deliberately lying about the fact they're in Luxembourg um, because Luxembourg has a zero VAT rate. Sorry, I'll unmute myself before I speak. I've just noticed on there, Carol saying she was actually asking about the impact on buyers as well as sellers. Um, and I'm going to combine that with another question that I have here. I've heard quite a lot of things about um, people are saying they're actually worried that it's going to reduce the choice of what they can actually buy and that sellers are excluding the EU being able to buy their services at all from other parts of the world. Um, I've heard this particularly from US businesses um, which is kind of which I think, as Les might want to mention, um, rules have been in place for quite a long time for the for the US, but that's a totally different story. Um, can you just 
talk about is is this a real danger of buyers re having a reduced choice and is how much is it actually going to affect buyers are they going to be put off buying things from you because you forced to comply with these rules I'll answer that one then um, it's <laughs> The answer is yes. Google, um, even before the rules came in, have already restricted services. Um, there's a service called Google Help Out. Um, if you are in the UK or the EU, you're not actually allowed to have a paid for service any longer. Um, we have to say, it sounds very, very bad, but we were actually quite excited when we found that out because it, we had a really good, massive name who, they have, they have no problems with profits. Uh, there's no reason that they'd be doing that than other than I could think of is they don't want to deal with the admin. Um, and yes, it is. Um, basically, in the UK and uh, any any business in the EU, then we're not allowed to restrict um, sales actually based on the anti discrimination rules. There are other ways we'll say around that that we are looking into the um, legal side of that, for example, um, intellectual property. But again, each business needs to make their own decision based on that. But as a blanket thing, you're not actually allowed to um, restrict if you're in the EU. Of course, that doesn't stop any business outside of the EU from restricting sales to the UK and the Europe. And it's business after business after business is saying, you're in the EU, we're not going to sell to you. Rosie, what kind of businesses have you seen that are actually doing that at the moment? Well, well, the first one I saw, it's um, a six-figure turnover business in Australia, who I won't name the business, but base, I, well, I, I'm on her mailing list. I was actually going to buy her program in there, <laughs> but uh, not, you won't, I, unfortunately, I won't be able to because she actually teaches businesses to take the their digital sales from, well, the kind of level that, that, that I was on, right to the point of it, you actually being able to run that particularly through uh, you know outsourcing a lot of the admin and a lot of the um, support that you need for you know refunds and that kind of thing so you have all that income without it being a time-based model and of course that's very very powerful for a lot of reasons including government revenue because of course if you have that then it doesn't matter if you have to take time to look after children or old people and you know all of those government revenue things that are very concerned about and we are as well it's a very, very powerful model for everybody, including government revenue. Um, and she, is, she has actually withdrawn that. Um, many, many launches haven't, haven't happened. Um, i trying to think. Off, offhand, I can't actually think of any other specific examples, but the, I've, I've lost count of the number of tweets of people who said, I wanted to buy this, I wanted to buy that, I can't now. Um, I've seen many posts um, of people saying basically if you want to buy more products you're going to have to buy them now because I'm going to be restricting sales, get them now or get them before the price goes up, that's another one. Thank you Rosie, um, that actually kind of brings me a little bit into another question. We talked a lot about digital services and I'd like to come to Rosie first with this and then I'd like to come to Les with this as well. A lot of people are saying, oh well I'll just add a live element. Where does a live element, obviously if, it was enti if it's entirely live and it's like a virtual classroom education wise, at the moment that isn't caught under the, the rules, I, I state at the moment. Can you comment at all on what what is the what is the e, what is the HMRC and what is the rest of Europe saying counts as human interaction? How much live do you need to have, for example? Uh, can I give that to you? This is one of the problems and one of the reasons we actually the goals of the campaign is because there isn't one. Um, for the UK, your sales, assuming your VAT registered um, in we'll call it the normal way. Um, then H, what HMRC says does apply to your sales once they sort out the contradictions in their paperwork, uh, which I'm sure they'll do with time. For the other countries, you need to apply their interpretation. So, for example, Finland, and of course you're not necessarily going to know which country your buyers are going to buy from in advance. In Finland, if you email your a, a PDF of your ebook, for example, 
that does count as digital service. For other countries, it doesn't. Um, there isn't because there is no minimum threshold. Unless it is completely live, then it could actually be caught. So, for example, if this was a paid um, webinar, then um, this is absolutely fine, wouldn't be. But if, for example, um, you were recording it and then you sent the recording to the people, that, technically speaking, could actually be, be, be under it. I probably wouldn't worry about it for UK purposes, but um, certainly for the other countries. This is why we need, a U, we need a, an EU level agreement, because we can't simultaneously apply 28 different interpretations. Les, do you have anything to say on that? Yeah, I mean, that, that that's, that's, that's true in all sorts of areas of VAT, and, and what Rose has said is you know, regarding digital services applied to other areas of that law for, for years and years. But of course, as we've said already, this applies largely to smaller businesses, whereas some of the other issues is, is, you know, related to larger businesses with resources to fight it. The legislation, the European legislation, talks about a supply which is essentially automated. Um, and so, again, as, as, as Rosie said, this live feed is not essentially automated. It doesn't fall within that. Therefore, it wouldn't fall within MOS. But if at a later date, um, Link for Growth said, oh, we're going to provide it as a sim single download, you, you buy a, a video file of it, uh, which is essentially automated, then it does fall within MOS. And then the question therefore arises, how much do I need to do to an automated service so that it has more than minimal human intervention? And that's where, that's the piece of string question, and that is very difficult. As Rosie says, um, I mean, in practice, you know, the UK business has to make its decision and say, okay, I will add the following human interventions as far as possible to ensure that I fall within the European guidance. And then if the Finnish authorities come knocking at the door via HMRC, then I can at least say, well, this is the advice I took and this is what I did and leave them to fight it. Now, whether the Finnish authorities would therefore argue over £100 of VAT, I hope not. Um, but it's unpredictable. And, and one of the difficulties is that it leaves every business uncertain as to where they stand. But, but my advice in general terms is, how do you put something in that prevents it being essentially automated? What extra human intervention can you add in depending on what you're providing, so that you come out of MOS, if that's what your intention is. So it's not an easy one because every every business is the same. It is different, but that, that's the way I would start. Yeah, it kind of sounds like it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all answer, is it? It's something that I think people are going to have to think about for themselves, for their own businesses and I know Rose has said this several times, you need to look at your own business and what's going to work for you. Um, this kind of quite nicely brings me into a question that I want to direct at Les. Um, it's all well and good talking about this, but what if like a lot of um, small business owners, I actually do more than one thing. I've actually got two businesses. Now, one of the, they're in completely separate industries and so on. Can I register and have one caught under moss and the other one be not registered? Or if I register for one business, does that catch all businesses that I'm then involved in? The, the answer is quite complex because the UK legislation regarding what's called desegregation is complex. But let's say that I have two limited companies uh, and one of them provides VAT advice, which it does, which is what I do, and the other one provides, um, what should we say, some online training, um, so entirely different. If those were separate limited companies and I was the sole director of the two, then the MOS rules would apply to either individually. If those were simply both 
me as a sole trader, then Moss would apply to both of them automatically. So therefore, it's in the interest of someone who runs two or three or ten quite distinct business activities to already arrange their affairs properly so that they are separate limited companies or separate partnerships, for instance, and therefore you apply MOSS, um, you ask the MOSS question in relation to each. And again, to pick up one of Rose's points, here is perhaps an opportunity for some of those activities to boost them, to develop them, perhaps to, to change them slightly. So it might be a threat, but equally it's an opportunity for some of those sorts of organizations. As usual, it's not just a simple answer, is it? Um, I think I have probably one more question for you, Les. What are the consequences if we actually don't follow these rules? From a, not from a going out of business point of view or from a, an administrative point of view, which is the sort of stuff that Rose has already covered, but more from a, a legal and VAT compliance point of view. Okay, the, the, uh, no one will go to prison unless they're de deliberately fraudulent. Okay, so we're not talking about those people here. We're talking about people who've made genuine mistakes. In simple terms, there will be a financial penalty. Now, it's interesting, Rosie, and thanks to Rosie, there's a light touch. European Commission last summer insisted there would be no light touch. Um, so we're pleased we've got six months of that. But unfortunately, legislation can't have a light touch. It's the application of the legislation. So the legislation creates what's called a strict liability. So you are liable to be registered because you've sold one automated download of a knitting pattern for one euro. That's a strict liability. You have to register under MOSS. End of. So your, your question then is, how is that um, failure to, um, to register how is that punished civilly? And that's where this light touch comes in. And the HMRC, and, and from what I understand, the EU have said, OK, we're going to give you six months just to get your act together uh, and sort that out. Again, you know, it's too early to know how much HMRC have honoured that. Um, you know, if some keen officer is out there, he might see a, a UK trader's failure to register. He might just send them a you know, a penalty letter for failing to register. So, you know, let's see the evidence of that in that six months. It'd be interesting to see how many people, um, you know, are relieved from penalties in that time. And, uh, you know, that would be an interesting to, thing to see. But, you know, people can grumble at a light touch that applies for one sector of the economy. Why doesn't that apply somewhere else? And so, you know, you're already at inviting another question about injustice. So it's, it's, um, it's complex. So, you know, our advice is always, you know, be compliant, get the support you need, get the answers you need so that you can be compliant rather than, you know, trying to take a risk and you know, hope nobody finds you. Thank you, Les. Um, I think we've kind of... Um, covered an awful lot of stuff in the sh in the show, and I suspect people's heads are kind of starting to reel somewhat from all the complexity of it. it sounded so simple with my one sentence at the start. I'm sorry, it really isn't. I wish it was. I'd just like to um, give both Les and Rosie an opportunity to make any last um, comments or thoughts they want to, want to give to us or anything they want to leave us with. And then finally, how you can find them, get in touch with them if you want some VAT advice or want to find out more about the VAT Action Group. Um, if, if you could to sort of give us some final words and I will start with um, Les. Okay, um, don't put your head in the sand. That was one of the comments made on one of the Facebook... Um, sorry, my phone has gone for the first time. I, I tried to put it on silent but I, I couldn't make it work. So I was in a Facebook group which was to do with Moss. And somebody said, don't put your head in the sand. So I said, I like it. Don't put your head in the sand. You know, it won't go away. 
you know, that is here to stay. It's been around for too long. Um, so, you know, make sure you get advice as far as you can. If you want to contact me, uh, my website is vatadvice.org. And go there. You can email me direct from that. I guess there's an events page through the Hangout, and uh, you can contact me through that. And some of the questions that we've got, I can you know, flesh out some of the technical answers, provide links to the EU HMRC website, and um, you know, hopefully get uh, get people through the VAT maze. It's VAT moss and VAT mess. Um, there's one or two other specialist providers out there. They're very active, and some of them are very good. So, you know, there'll be some good support there. Thank you, Les. And Rosie, would you like to like say to a few words? words? I'd like to arouse and call to everybody just to stay positive. Um, and if you are trying to get your head around this, to be honest, not even us in the VAT action group, we actually all divided up different tasks. None of us, one person of us, can actually get their head around this. Not even the experts in the EU. Um, we've actually spoken to a lot of the country's um, um, top people on this. Once we started explaining what this actually meant, they couldn't get their heads around it. So I would say get enough information to make the right decision for your business. Decide what you're going to do for the next six months to a year. Go and put that in place. and then. To keep up and then not worry about it but we the reason we've got so far so quickly and it has been absolutely astonishing how far we've, we've got so quickly is actually because of this, all the support that, that we've got it's been all the people writing to their MEPs to their to their MPs that makes a big difference so I would say at the moment please sign up on the um, please sign the petition to Pierre Moscovici who's the um, top of the EU do do we need to chose my we need to change there's a link on the EU VAT action.org website and what we need at the moment is for you to ask to actually visit to go and see your MEP because the focus for this needs to come from the EU not just the UK to actually physically go and see them they're paying attention to us a lot more because of election time so if you can just take a little bit of time out of your day and um, ask to go and see them to say the thing you're really concerned about at the moment is EU VAT and the the, the, the action get them up to speed so they don't just believe the party line as opposed to being required to email you the party line when you write to them in thousands. So thank you to everybody and the details on the website. Excellent. Thank Excellent. you very much. Thank you very much both Rosie and Les there. Um, we've covered so much in the show today and I know that we, I know that people are going to want much, much more on this so people will be following the links and coming and asking you questions and so on. I'd just like to emphasize just at the end of the show here that everything that we've said today is general advice. It's not to be taken as actual accounting and VAT specific advice. You must contact your own advisors and get your own information or confirmation from HMRC as well. I'd just like to say a couple of words as well about um, this is the Link for Growth Finance show. We're going to be doing one of these shows every month for the next year. So I'd like to say if anyone's got any ideas of what they want us to cover, if anyone's an expert in the finance, the money, anything to do with that, not just in the accounting and tax sense, but you might it might be to do with money mindset, um, it could be money blocks, it might be about crowdfunding. If you have questions about it or in fact you're an expert in one of the arenas and you'd like to be a guest on a future show, please get in touch with us and we can start a conversation and see where we can take it from there. Um, if you would like to be notified about any future shows from the finance show then please let us know and we can put you on a list make sure you know when our next next show is and I'd just like to say once again a final thank you to Les and to Rosie for taking the time out of their busy schedules to help us to understand the total VAT mess that is out there and this isn't going away this affects everybody um, it affects you if you're a customer or a, a supplier, it doesn't matter who you are, it 
it affects you. So on that on that note, I will say thank you very much for watching, and I hope to catch you again on the next show. Bye.